good to be here today to worship the Lord and to study his word, to hear from what God has to say. We're continuing on in Galatians, into Galatians chapter 6. And uh, this will be the second last message in Galatians. Jeff Vine will bring the final one on the 1st of January. Next week is Christmas Day, of course, and Kevin will be speaking then. But uh, when Kevin finished last week, he had his set of slides, and uh, I was going to sort of re reproduce his last slide and put it up there just as a reminder. But then I haven't really got much others in there that I need slides for. So uh, I'm just going to read that last slide out. It uh, goes like this. He says, it was the conclusion. He says, number one point, live under the Holy Spirit's control. That's fair enough. Live under the Holy Spirit's control. Number two was obey every leading of the Holy Spirit. Number three, knowing this will defeat any fleshly desires. And number four was believing this will result in Jesus' life being reproduced in you. And it's this last point that introduces this chapter six, which is logical. You go from chapter five to chapter six, the conclusion of that one starts the introduction for this one. And so we're looking at the application of the fruit of the spirit in this chapter. And uh, so let's, let's read chapter six. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should, should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with the instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunities, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So in Galatians chapter 5, we're learning about uh, living by the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. First of all, it means that we do not live according to our old fleshly nature. Remember, we had to put off that old fleshly nature, and uh, there's a whole list of things there. We had to get rid of those, but instead, we had to put and uh, put on the fruit of the Spirit, and uh, and that is summed up in the uh, words of is the Spirit of love. Now in chapter 6, he is putting this teaching into action. And this is the practical application of chapter 5. Our first verse reads, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin. Now that's the NIV translation. And it's not probably not quite right. The King James says, if a man is overtaken in a fault. Now there's a bit of difference there if he's caught in a sin or overtaken in a fault, there's a bit of difference. So I just want to try to clarify what's happening here. The word translated fault or sin, um, and it's, please excuse my Greek, is paratoma, I believe. That's how you say it. And I found that it is only used a few times in the New Testament. And uh, I'll just give you a couple of uh, illustrations of how this word this is, is translated. In Ephesians 1 and 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. That's the same word as the word that he says if somebody's caught in a sin. 
Colossians 2.13, when you were dead in your sins, that's the same word. James 5.16, therefore confess your sins to each other. So there's a difference there. I think Kevin went into fairly deeply about the difference between sin and sins. I won't go into that again, but um, we're looking at this word here is sin, caught in a sin or sins. Now, the commentaries I've got at home, they all agree that uh, this sin or fault is not a uh, very critical situation. I'm trying to think of a word to how to put it. It's a, a problem that can be, uh, it's, it's a lesser problem, is one way that like one commentary put it. And because uh, the word for sin, uh, which means to fall short or to miss the mark, as we find in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's a different word to what we're looking at here. And, um, but the apostle has chosen a softer terminology. He's chosen something that is not quite as harsh as being caught or, or being um, uh, yeah, or sinning. It's a bit like you're being trapped by the devil, which where uh, he trips us up and uh, seduces us, and we're trapped. It's like saying, "Well, um, what is more human than for a human being to fall, to be deceived, and to err?" We all make mistakes. We all err. Uh, we all we all fall short. But this word is that it's not quite so bad. And uh, now since this letter is being written to uh, a, a teach about false teachers, I'm going to assume that he's referring here to people who are caught up in false teaching. And uh, so th that'll be my slant here, is that these people have been caught up with false teaching. It wasn't intentional. They were just trapped. And, but the trouble is, when they're trapped and they start to get involved in false teaching, they drag other people away with them. And so that needs to be addressed. It, we need to speak to people about that when we see this thing happening. Now, Paul has already given us the, the example back in Galatians chapter 2, where he had to call Peter out and say, why? Are you being so hypocritical? You're a Jew. You live with the Gentiles, and now the Gentile, these Judaizers come in here, and you. He had to call him out. He had to correct him. So he's already given the example of how to handle these people. So, uh, but uh, we need to have a desire to see this person corrected and brought back to Christ, or as the word, the word says here, being restored. Back in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, Paul gives us the teaching on if somebody is caught uh, in adultery sin, he says, this is how you deal with it. And you can read that. But he said, at the same time, it is there to restore that person. You want to save them. And in uh, verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 5, he says, we're going to hand that man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. We're going to see the person saved or restored. Then he says, you who live by the spirit should restore that person gently. Paul has just been through all the fruit of the spirit in chapter 5. And that's our guideline. If we're going to be involved in somebody else's life, we need to make sure that we are living using the fruit of the Spirit, displaying the fruit of the Spirit. Now, it takes a great deal of love and courage for someone to approach a brother who has fallen and to try to help him. But we need to do it. We must be living by the Spirit and showing the fruit of the Spirit in our own lives first. How easy it is to condemn somebody when we are probably doing the same things or worse things, maybe in a different way, but we still do it. 
Jesus said that first we must remove the plank out of our own eye before we try to remove the speck out of somebody else's eye. Bit of eye surgery needed. And um, so we are told to restore that person gently. So uh, when we start to speak that person, we must do it gently. We are to restore that person gently. Not critically, not judgmentally, but lovingly. Now, Lance Foley spoke about this a couple or five weeks ago when he came here the first time about how to handle a situation gently. We need to do that. We need to have an attitude of prayer. We need to have the Holy Spirit working through us before we even start. We must let him have complete control of the situation. But what happens when you've gone and spoken to somebody and they do not listen? It becomes a very sticky situation. And I've seen it before. They, uh, you know, you just, people throw their arms up in the air. They end up feeling, I've been hurt. You hurt me. And so I'm not coming to church anymore. In fact, I'm not going to church, any church anymore. And people just get, get that. They just really throw, throw their arms up in the air. We, when we go to speak to somebody, we are responsible for our words. We are responsible for what we say. We are responsible for how we say it. So we need to be in prayer. We need to be committing it to God. That person we're speaking to, they are responsible for how they act, how they respond. That's their responsibility. But we still need to uh, deal with them gently. Uh, then Paul goes on to say, but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Paul gives us this timely warning. He knew that some teachers and pastors needed to be reminded that they have to consider the fallen and show mercy. In the book entitled The Lives of Our Fathers, one of the fathers is reported to have said when informed that a brother had fallen into adultery, he fell yesterday, I may fall today. We need to be careful that we don't fall. Paul warns the pastors, the teachers, not to be too rigorous, not to be unmerciful, but to be merciful and deal with these people gently. Remember that one, that, that man fell for today, we could be falling. Now, if those who are eager to condemn others were to just investigate their own lives first, they would see that they are likely to be caught in a similar situation. And we need to remember that when we, before we go and talk to somebody, that we need to make sure that we are displaying the fruit of the Spirit. And also remember this, when you point the finger at somebody, there's three fingers pointing back at you. Remember that. And there will be people who will be looking and they'll be pointing the fingers back at you. But you did this, you said that. So we need to be careful how we handle these situations. Jane Jobson says this, whenever, whenever I'm tempted to become self-important and authoritative, I'm reminded of what the mother whale said to her baby. When you get to the stop and start to blow, that's when you get harpooned. And so it is. That's good advice. We get to the top, we start blowing, and we'll get harpooned. And then he says to restore that person gently. Now, the spiritual man would seek to restore the brother in love. The legalist, he wants to take advantage of him. Now, the word restore means to mend as you mend a net or to restore a broken arm or a broken bone. Now, I've been fortunate, I haven't had a, oh, I've had a crack that bone in my ankle, but really I haven't had a broken bone. And, um, but they're painful. You go to the doctor with a broken arm, 
you walk in there and you don't expect them to say, oh, that's bad. Let's chop it off. That's what people do with church. They say, oh, let's get rid of them. They're bad. No, it needs to be reset. It needs to be restored. You straighten it up, put plaster on it, and it's restored. So that's how we're to handle these situations. We're able to re restore them gently, lovingly. And then after we've restored, the, been bandaged up and set in place and restored, you take the plaster off, the arm's weak. We need some physio. We need to get some exercises. And we need some spiritual physio. We need to get beside these people and encourage them and to teach them. We need to do that. In other words, discipleship would probably cover that. We need to be do encouraging people and loving them back into uh, our church fellowship, into service for God. But then he says, but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Paul is concerned about the well-being of all the believers. Not just the person who has been fallen, but the one who is uh, dealing with that situation. The spiritual believer, as he calls him here. He's concerned about them all. And he says, be careful, lest you fall also. And uh, now the problem is we can become so puffed up with pride that we, uh, yeah, we just, just lose it all. Beware, lest we fall also. Pride is a terrible thing. Lloyd Corey, in his book, quote, unquote, says this, Pride is the only disease known to man that makes everyone sick except the person who has it. We need to be aware of pride. Pride and uh, nobody likes somebody who's really proud. Beware. Then he says to carry each other's burdens. Now, burdens are something we are not meant to carry. They're, they're, they're a really heavy load. And when we get those heavy loads, we need help. There's not a, no contradiction here, but in verse 5 it says, we are to, uh, each one should carry his own load. There's no contradiction here. There's two different words for load or burden. I'll just cover these two here to clarify it. The load in verse 2 is this heavy burden load that we're not meant to have. In, cha in, cha in verse 5, it is um, described as the soldier's pack. Every soldier has to carry his own backpack. He's meant to carry that. He doesn't need help. But the person with the heavy load, with the burden, he needs help and we must help them. Max Licardo says this, legalism has no pity on people. Legalism makes my opinion your burden makes my opinion your boundary, makes my opinion your obligation. Legalism adds to the weight. Legalism does not help with the load. The legalist increases the burden. He doesn't reduce it. Back in Acts chapter 15, we've been hearing a bit about Acts 15 where they had the church council and uh, talking about circumcision and all the rest of it. And uh, Peter says to them in uh, Acts 15, 10, Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? Peter says, don't load them up with these things, with these burdens. You're supposed to be lifting the burden, not loading them. So let us not increase the burden by applying man-made rules. The Pharisees did this and Jesus condemned them. Instead, let us share our experience of freedom in Christ by lifting the burdens. Then he says, to fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? There's only one law that I can think of that Christ gave us. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. To love one another means to carry another's burdens, to help others carry them. 
Christians must have strong shoulders to bear the burdens of their fellow Christians. And the spirit-led believer approaches the matter in a spirit of meekness and love. In contrast that, the legalist has an attitude of pride and condemnation. The legalist does not need to consider himself because he pretends he could never commit those sins. But the believer living by grace realizes that no man is immune from falling. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 12, we are told, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. We are to have an attitude of humility because we realize our own weaknesses. The legalist, of course, has no time for this kind of spiritual soul winning. When he hears that his brother has sinned, what's he do? Hey, did you hear about so and so? Oh, I'm telling you, so you can pray for them earnestly. What's he doing? He's gossiping. He's spreading. Yeah, he's just really, really spreading the news bad. And it makes him look good. That's what the, the uh, legalist says. And he puts under the guys, oh, so I'm telling you this just so we can pray more earnestly for them. But he's condemning the brother and lifting himself up at the same time. So Paul warns us that we are more, to be more concerned well, that the uh, spiritualist is more concerned about the outward experience or the outward impression. And uh, we learn a bit more about that in next, well, when Jeff comes on in the 1st of January, uh, in Galatians 6, 12 to 14, we'll hear a bit more about that. Now back to Galatians chapter 6 and verses 4 and 5, he says, each man should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else, for each man should carry his own load. And I've covered the last part of that, but the first part, there's no place in comparing ourselves with someone else. If you're going to compare yourself with somebody, compare yourself with the Lord. He's the one to be our standard. We have to compare ourselves to the Lord. And... Uh, when you read something and you read some words like, um, oh, the best or the best and the fastest growing or the largest numbers and uh, you know, things like this, who's getting the glory? You want to give God the glory. So people say, well, in that case, we don't keep records. No, no, we do keep records. Charles Haddon Spurgeon used to say, those people who criticize statistics usually do not have any to report. But we must be careful that we are not making others look bad just to make ourselves look good. And we should be able to rejoice at the achievements and blessings of others just as if they were our own. After all, we're all part of the body. And if one body, part of the body is blessed, the whole part of the body, the whole body is blessed. So now we come to the second half of our Bible reading, verses 6 to 10, where we're encouraged to share and to do good works. Now from the very beginning of the church, back in Acts chapter 2, the whole church shared. They had things in common. They were doing it all along. But now Paul encourages us to share. First of all, he begins by urging to share with one another. He says, the teacher stands up and he shares. He shares the treasures from the Bible. He, the teacher teaches you. He shares. Then he turns around and says, so you with your, your good things, you should share with the teacher. In other words, the teacher should be paid. That's why a lot of churches have pastors. So share. We share our good things. We share the teaching, we share the word, and we share the ministry. Paul worked as a tent maker to cover his expenses. He didn't want to be a burden on the, on the unsaved or on the church. But Paul always said 
that the preacher or teacher should get his living from his teaching and that he should be paid for preaching and teaching. Jesus said in Luke 10, 7, the labourer is worthy of his hire. And Paul echoed that statement in 1 Corinthians 9, 11, and 1 Corinthians 9, 14. We must remember that what we do with our material treasures is an indication of how we value spiritual things. He says, Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. But did you realise that uh, I think I'm jumping a bit there. Uh, so, but we must realise the spiritual principle that lies behind this teaching. God does not command believers to give simply so that teachers, missionaries, or others get a living. But he's doing it so when you give, you get a blessing as well. You, you are blessed. So the basic principle of sowing and reaping is found throughout the entire Bible. God has endorsed that principle. We reap what we sow. God has also told us to be careful where we slow, sow. And this, this principle that Paul deals with here, he looks on the material possessions as seed. And he sees two possible kinds of soil. This is a bit different to the gospel, isn't it? He said the, the soil of the flesh or the soil of the spirit. We can use our material goods to promote the flesh, or we can use our material goods to promote the spirit or, or godly things. But once we have finished sowing, we can't change that. Money sown to the flesh will bring forward a harvest of corruption. Money, that money is gone, can never be reclaimed. We can only invest it once, so we must choose our investments wisely. Money sown to the spirit, such as sharing with those who teach the word or the, uh, the missionaries and whatever, that'll produce life. And that harvest will produce more seeds that can be planted again for another harvest. And on and on it goes for eternity. If every believer only looked on his material wealth as seed and planted it properly, there would be no lack of funds for the work of the Lord. Sad to say, much seed is wasted on selfish wants and can never bring glory to God. We give to the church. The church gives to the missionaries. That makes us all sharers in the ministry on the mission fields, all sharers in the work. Of course, there is a much wider application of the principle applied to our lives because all that we do is either an investment in the flesh or in the spirit. We shall reap whatever we have sown, and we shall reap in proportion as we have sown. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Believer who walks in the spirit and, and sows in the spirit is going to reap spiritual harvest. If his sowing has been generous, the harvest will be bountiful. If not in this life, certainly in the life to come. Paul's enemies, the Judaizers, did not have this spiritual attitude toward giving and receiving. Paul sacrificed and labored, labored that he might not be a burden to the church, but the false teachers used the church to promote their own schemes and to line their own pockets. Having given us the teaching in verse 6 and the principle behind that teaching in verses 7 and 8, Paul now gives us a promise in verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the pr proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Behind this promise is a warning. Do not get weary in doing good. Don't give up. Keep going. Sometimes spiritual weariness is caused by lack of devotion in the Lord. We see this in the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Sometimes we faint because of lack of prayer. 
Luke 18, 1. Men should always pray and not give up. Pray, prayer is just as important as breathing in our own life. Prayer in our spiritual life keeps us going. You stop breathing and you'll soon get faint. I guarantee it. You stop praying and we'll soon faint. We need prayer. I used to have a, board, a thing to go up on the board out the front here. It says, one week, W-E-E-K, without prayer, makes one week, W-E-A-K. So we need to be careful that we maintain a time of prayer. It's also possible to faint because of lack of nourishment. Man shall not live by bread alone, Matthew 4, 4 says, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. How important it is to study, our word, study God's word every day. Do we have a quiet time every day? Do we set a tired time when we just read God's word, we spend some time in prayer, and we listen to what God is saying? We need that time to get the nourishment. We, need, we, eat, we eat food every day. I guarantee you everyone here eats food every day. But do we really study God's word every day? We should do. It's just as important. It's more important. And... Uh, we need to wait on the Lord. For the now the promise Paul gives us will help to keep us going. At the proper time, we will reap the harvest, he said. The seed that is planted does not bear fruit immediately. And this is important to remember. We have to wait. We plant the seed. You're going to teach kids at Sunday school. You teach teenagers. You teach and you plant and you seed and you water that plant and nothing seems to happen. I remember reading a book many years ago, I think it was something like about 50 years ago. It was 1962 when Don Richardson went to uh, the um, area in Jaya in New Guinea to the natives up there. And he had preached the word. He taught them. He, he learnt their language. He learnt their customs and he stayed with them and he taught them. And he just couldn't get a breakthrough. Every time he got to Judas, they, oh, he's a hero. Until he got to the point when he realized they had a peace child. And Jesus was the peace child. When he got to that point, they realized that Judas was the biggest traitor out because he killed the peace child. It took years. We need to keep watering that word. Keep it going. Don't give up, he says. We can get weary and tired and give up, but don't. It was the Lord's work, and the Lord gave the increase. Now, in nature, we have seasons when we get rain. We have seasons with sunshine. and We have all the seasons for nature to uh, function. And so it is with the God's word. There are seasons when the word is planted and it's watered. And we need to be a part of God's plan in watering and growing that seed. Remember that one plants the seed, another waters the seed, but God gives the increase. We cannot produce fruit without the Holy Spirit helping us. Sharing blessings involves much more than teaching the word and giving on their material possessions. It also involves doing good unto all men. Now, you might find it easy to, you know, if your mum or dad or your, somebody in the family needs some help, you can't give them a helping hand. Yeah, well, that's fine. Or a next door neighbor, uh, next door neighbor this last week has had COVID, so we have to help. But what about your enemy? Do we go out of our way to help our enemy when uh, we're told that we're to uh, be good to all men? Our good works. Our good works are actually a part of our worship. Did you realize that? In Hebrews 13, 16, we read this. And do not forget to do good and to share with others for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. 
If you want to please God, do some good works, help others. Do it. It's a part of our worship. We're to do good to all men. That's how we let our light shine before men and to glorify God. We're not, it's not only by words that we witness to the lost, but by our works. In fact, our works open the way for the uh, verbal witness. They win us the right to be heard. That's why ministries like hands and feet are so important. That's why ministries that are hands-on help so many people. And we can become a good Christian neighbour. We can become God's hands and feet in doing that. We shouldn't be asking the question, well, does that person really deserve my help? Did we, did, did I deserve God's help? I had done nothing that deserved God's help. So we need to be prepared to help and to do good to all men. But then he says to give priority to the household of faith, to fellow believers. This does not mean that the local church becomes an exclusive clique with members isolated from the world. We're to be helping others to have a balance. The believers in Paul's day certainly um, would have had greater need than those outside because they were being persecuted. But today, there are those outside the church who need help, and we need to be aware of them. The scripture is also clear when it comes to providing for our family members. 1 Timothy 5 and 8 says this, If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially his immediate family, he has denied the faith, and is worse than an unbeliever. As we help our family members, we are testifying to God's goodness. We are being an example to the neighbourhood. We're being an example to our friends, to others, that this is Christian love. And then we extend it to the non-Christians. We must remember, however, that we are to share with other Christians so that all of us might be able to share with a needy world. The Christian in the household of faith is a receiver that he might become a transmitter. I forget where I've read that, but it just hit home. The Christian in the household of faith is a receiver that he might become a transmitter. Are we transmitters? Are we sharing God's love? Are we sharing the, our faith with, with others? That's where we need to be. And that's how it's meant to be. So let us abound in love for one another. Let us overflow in love to all men. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, the instructions we get from your word. Lord, help us to be transmitters. Help us to help others and to help our families and be a witness to those around us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.